gift of freedom. Please go to your turn to your outline seat. We are celebrating the 246th birthday of our nation, like one of the kids said. If you need an outline, please, one of the ushers can give you one at this time. But we, mean, we must realize the true freedom, and I'm going to talk briefly about the, you know, the independence of the U.S. of A., but the reality is how does it affect us as believers? There's been 246 anniversaries of the independence of the U.S. of A., but we must understand that true freedom, true freedom cannot really exist without boundaries. In fact, some people think that freedom and discipline are diametrically opposed, and they're not. There's no contradiction between freedom and discipline in when the reality is that that freedom is the ultimate reward of discipline. And when we understand that we have freedom, we must also understand that with great freedom comes great responsibility. The freedoms that we enjoy in this nation, the freedoms that we have as American citizens, because yes, I am an American citizen, most of you, you are an American citizen, right? The freedoms that we have as American citizens did not come cheap, and they were not free. And by the same token, there's also a great responsibility that we must understand, because if we do not use the freedoms that we have in the right manner, we will suffer the consequences of the abuse of that freedom. In fact, the Apostle Paul is very clear as he is writing this letter to a, to a church in Galatia that was going through a struggle, through a war, it's going through a difficult time in terms of doctrinal statement. What's happening here, we're going to go right into Galatians 5.13 and 15. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. CFC English, let me remind you this morning, CFC English, you were called to be free. Nowhere, I mean, I, you know, I was born in a different country, and, and I don't think we ever celebrated the way we celebrate over here. Maybe I was younger, but we celebrate the 4th of July with fireworks, with food, barbecue, going swimming, and all that good stuff, right? We don't celebrate with Chile Verde, right? We make hamburgers and hot dogs, right? We don't make chicharrones. Carne asada we do, right? But we have freedoms that we enjoy, right? But there's one greater freedom that we must understand, and that is the freedom that we have in Christ. We have been called to be free, but now here's the warning. Here's the warning that Paul gave the church of Galatia. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you fight and devour each other, watch out, for you will be destroyed by each other. Can this really happen in the midst of people who love God? This morning, I want to bring your attention to the importance of the gift of freedom that God has given us. Number one, by highlighting our call. We have all been called. Our call is to be free. Our call, let me, before I move forward, let me skip a few steps back and put this passage in context by reading Galatians 5, verse 1. It says, it is for freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We have been called to be free. Absolutely free. Our freedom was paid by Christ on the cross of Calvary. One of the most powerful things you can experience as a child of God is to realize the purpose of your calling. And your calling is to freedom and to live a life of liberty in Christ Jesus. In chapter 5 of Galatians, Paul clearly is giving us a lecture of the freedom that we have. It is a freedom from sin. It is a freedom from guilt. It is a freedom from shame. And it is also a freedom from the punishment of sin. There's a passage in the Bible, and I'm, I'm going to quote it here, for the wages of sin is death. The penalty for the sins we've incurred in the past is death. 
But that debt was canceled, and the wages of sin were canceled, but why, by what Christ did on the cross for us, and giving us a life of freedom. And if you cannot understand this, let's look at what John writes in chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. It says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. Then, can you say out loud, then? Then. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If there is one passage in the Bible that is misquoted, it is this one right here. So many people, they just scream at the top of their lungs. Yeah, and the truth, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free without understanding the context of that statement. That statement is for disciples of Christ. When you do this, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So many people, I'm preaching this morning, so many people live in bondage. So many people, you know, maybe family members that live, that live in bondage to sin, to punishment, to shame. This morning, my friends, we have been giving a gift, a gift of freedom, but can only be accomplished when we understand the maxim that love is always more powerful than love. Love is always more powerful than love. Let us consider two things about our calling. We've been called. There is no doubt about it. I have been called. I was called that money from my mother's womb. When I was in my mother's womb, God called me right there. Thank you, Chris. God called you. When you realize this calling, there's two things that I want to bring to your attention this morning. The first one is to be abused of the gift of freedom. Be abused of the gift of freedom. What's the one thing that we can do when we abuse this gift? Number one, we can turn that freedom into a license. Turning that freedom into a license. There was a book written in it by Gordon McDonald. It's called Rebuilding Your Broken World. And I'm just going to paraphrase it because time is upon us this morning. But in essence, this story, and it's a true story, by the way, it says that Prince Charles and Princess and Diana, they were they were in the skiing, in the, in the uh, Swiss Alps. They were skiing. They were on a ski vacation. Being the prince that he was, that he is, he decided to go and ski in a place where he was prohibited to go skiing because there was the imminent danger of an avalanche. He ignored all the boundaries. He said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm the prince. I'm just going to take it upon myself. And him and his friends went ahead and skied in a place where they were not supposed to be skiing. Tragically, as the avalanche happened, and one of his friends, a close member that worked for the queen, lost his life. The question is, why? Because Prince Charles and his friends decided to go beyond the boundary that was established between them and sin. This morning, may I propose to you that we need to understand that boundaries are set to protect us. Many of us don't realize that we cross, we cross those boundaries sometimes in search of excitement. I'm, I'm just thinking, as I was studying my notes, I'm thinking, were they thinking it was going to be more exhilarating? Were they thinking it was going to be more fun? It was going to be close to the, I mean, it, we all, we've all done it. We, we run, we walk so close to this line of danger. That it, it, and yes, there's an adrenaline rush. We've all done it, right? But we need to understand that boundaries, freedom, our freedom has boundaries, but those boundaries were put in place to protect us. When we cross those boundaries, we abuse the freedom of our calling, and we cannot risk the danger of doing that. Galatians 5.13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. Every opportunity in life that we have. Every opportunity that has been given to us is a starting point or a base for operation. First Peter 2.16 it says, act as free men. And it says, but do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, 
but use it as bond slaves of God. And that word literally means someone that will serve God. When, when we realize the nature of our calling, we realize that my freedom is to serve other people because I am a bond slave of God. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God, God has prepared good works that you and I can walk. You and I can walk in the good works that God has prepared for us. That's going to put us to the list. One thing that I must make very clear this morning. We are saved by grace. Nothing, my friends, nothing you can do will, you cannot earn your way into heaven. Nobody can. As good as you think you are, you can never pay your, your debt to get into heaven. You cannot buy your own ticket. Somebody pays for it. Somebody by grace. By grace. But the good works that we do, we are not to save ourselves, but they are to honor the God that made us. To honor the God who called us. So the first thing that, that we can is that we are we can use this freedom as a license. But the second thing about abusing our calling, our freedom, is that we can turn, which is the other side of the spectrum, right? Which is turning our freedom into legalism. Do you all know what legalism is? I know firsthand. I grew up in a church where las hermanas, the sisters, could not come with pants. You were like, what? Yeah, yeah, it, it happened. Once in a lifetime, once a long while ago, I was, and, and I, I, I've been to church and to, and many years ago where nobody, the, the sisters did not do makeup, did not do healing, or jewelry, and I am not condemning, and I'm not, you know, criticizing anyone to each his own, but we run the danger of running into legalism when we don't do it right, when we don't have the proper knowledge of our calling. Why do you say this? Look at what Galatians 5.13 says. If you fight and devour each other, watch how you will be destroyed by each other. This is not something that could have happened. It was already happened. There were believers in Christ who had just, who had just come to know the Lord. They were saved. They were enjoying their freedom in Christ. But then some legalist preachers came to this region of the world started to tell them they, they needed to live under the law. And Paul went berserk about it. No. He just went, oh, how can you do this? You cannot have a mixture of law and grace. It's like mixing oil and water. They don't work together. See, on one side of abusing our freedom is to do anything we want. To indulge in the flesh. Anything that I can do whatever I want, I don't care. But the other side of this abuse is to live a life of legalism, legalism. Where every, where you think that what you do on the outside is going to affect what you what's going on, on the inside, and it's not the way. Paul is telling them, if you continue to do this, you will end up destroying each other. Look at Galatians 2 4. You may ask, why do you say that? Well, Here's the proof. Galatians 2, 4, it says, This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. See, we fail to realize that sometimes the expenses will make us, will keep us safe. I, I completely believe that. The safe, those expenses, those boundaries that we build will keep us safe. But if we are not careful, listen up, church, because I need you to be clear on this matter. Those same fences that are used to protect us, those same fences, if we're not careful, can also keep people out. People that need to hear the grace of God. People that need to know that we're calling them into a life of freedom in Jesus Christ. We need to be careful that those fences 
don't keep those people that are in need out. That's the devastating poison of legalism. It chokes out the life of people who want to live in freedom in Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the people. And then 1 Corinthians 10, 48 and 49 says, But if someone says to you, This has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. Both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? Now, this passage has been taken out of context so many times. Because we say, I can do whatever I want to do. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful that whatever I do is not a stumbling block to my fellow believer, to my fellow sister or brother in Christ. Whatever I do, I'm going to be cautious. We, I'm going to give you a 20 second example. Many, 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 many moons ago, I was 21 years old and I was a teacher of the adult Sunday school class in my church. And back then, it was it was in the 80s, okay? And I had, and I could I don't know how to say it, but I had a little mullet going on. It was trendy back then. I looked really good in it, okay? Really good. But it offended one of my adults who was very old-fashioned. And he told me, I love the way you teach, but I don't like the way you head. What I did was to get into my Sunday school, and then we had our service at school class. In the middle of the service, I went to the barber and I cut my hair. And I came back and I did the same thing. Did I have to do that? Absolutely not. What I did for the sake of my brother, I didn't want him to stumble. There was my freedom will, will take me when I am responsible about my about my family interest. Not for my own conscience. I was perfectly fine. I looked great every morning. I'm like, wow, that looks good. You know, I wish I had. I wish I have. I wish I had now what I had back then. It's like, but it doesn't happen. But my freedom in Christ needs to be within the boundaries of what is right. Amen. Are we all? Are we all here? Number three. So if we have abuse, what is the proper use of the gift of freedom? Yeah. Because if God has given us freedom, there has to be something. There has to be the right use of it. Well, number one, I love this. The number one way you're going to use your freedom is by serving, by serving one another. I love to serve. I love to serve. I, I really do. I believe that the greatest way you can express your love is by serving someone. Jerry, the best way you can serve your wife, the best way you can love your wife is by serving your wife. My night is the best way you can show your love to someone is by serving them. Absolutely. Look at what it says right here. I'm just going to read the last the last portion. Serve one another humbly in time. Serve one another humbly in time. First Corinthians 9, 19 to the 23rd. It says, look at what, what Paul is writing. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though myself, I am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I have become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak. To win the weak. I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. When we understand that our freedom is to serve others, we become really free indeed. When I say, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about me. How can I help you? If, and it doesn't matter if I'm the pastor. It doesn't matter, Damari, if you are the singer. Serving one another, it is one of the ultimate ways because you can display the freedom that you have. 
you will never diminish your calling. You will never stoop down, not using your spirituality or your service to God. In the eyes of God, it brings glory to Him. Church, we need to realize, young people, listen up. Serving one another is one of the greatest things you can do to develop or to even show the character of Christ. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for us. That is the best way we can do it. The person who is freed from both the slavery of the law and the slavery of himself will find true freedom as a slave of Christ and a servant of the community of believers. The second way we can really, really use properly our freedom is by loving one another. And we just read it. We read it here on Galatians 5.14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. I serve people and I love people. Wouldn't you think, wouldn't you think that the church, the church and the world would be such a better place if we serve one another and we love people than when we love them. The law builds fences around what we shouldn't do. But love builds bridges to new places where we can serve one another in love. Romans 13, 18, 10. It says, Let no dead remain outstanding except the continuing death to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. I'm not going to read the rest of the passage. If you want to keep the law of God, there may be some one of you that may be saying, I want to keep the law. Stop. Stop. Right there it says. Right there. It says that we fulfill the law. Every single commandment it is fulfilled when we love. See, that's the one thing we realize. When we love others, we have fulfilled the law. Let me wrap up right here, right now. God has given us a great gift called freedom. My question to you is, what are you going to do with the freedom that God has given you? Are you going to use it to love? Are you going to use it to serve? Are you going to use it to value others the way you should? Or are you, going to, or are you going to use it as a license to do what you please? To do what you want? Think about how and when you will use the freedom that Christ has given you. The way each one of us uses our freedom in Christ will determine what kind of community, what kind of country, we will have. Tomorrow, as you hear the fireworks and you'll be needing to be going to the house with your family, be mindful. Be mindful of the freedom we have in Christ. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning and let us pray together. If you have a loved one sitting next to you, their hand and let's be grateful for the great gift of living in this God blessed nation and but more than that be grateful for the freedom that we have in Christ. Thank you Father for every family that is under the sound of my voice we ask you God that we will be able to rejoice as family as Americans as believers in Christ, as disciples in Christ, the freedom that we have. Thank you, Father. And I pray that everything we do is to serve others and to love people. We thank you, Father, for CFC Chapel. Make us a beacon, Father, to this place in the world that many may come to know you and experience true freedom in Christ. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, God bless you.